Welcome back to another episode of the Development by David podcast. This week, your sponsor is me. If you wish to help caffeinate this podcast, then you can use the link in my bio at buymeacoffee.com to supply me with a coffee or two or three. Depends how generous you feel. This podcast takes a lot of work, a lot of energy, and that's supplied by my caffeine intake. And if you wish to support the podcast, then please donate me a coffee. Doing good. Thank you so much for doing this early. Man, it's fucking half seven where you are, yeah? Half seven, mate. What time is it in Singapore? Uh, half true. So, half three in the so plenty of time to chill out, get ready before work, all the usual shit, you know? Yeah, because you, you work all kind of a weird, not a weird shift pattern, but you work kind of into the evening, don't you? I work a fuck weird, a fucking weird shift, that's right. So I'm mainly, my like nine to five is five to one. Does that make sense? Wow, okay. Yeah, so... Then in the morning, like I do all my agency stuff, all my podcast stuff, all my training, and then all the content. And then I'll start my Revolut work around two, and I'll do like two to one a.m. usually, just about that. Because I'll have calls to one a.m. or two a.m. So I'm on any given day, I'm generally going for about fifteen to sixteen hours at this stage. What time do you go to sleep at per night? T- two. So, but I have a. A typical day might involve you doing a call and then going straight to sleep. Every day. So of course, like that's fucking one on one horrific for for your sleep. But I um so basically I'll finish my protocols at like one or two and then I'll just go straight to bed. So like all I've all ring lighting that's all like, you know, fucking red lighting or whatever it's meant to be, the darker time. Turn off all my phone and stuff, but I just I'm just still working quite late and then uh but I get good at sleep. Like I have a really good bed, like all like important shit like that. But if I'm doing something that's like super stressful, I won't sleep that well. So if I get for for example, like I, uh, so with my agency, I'm trying to, well, no, I've just started with this new client that's based in LA and LA is 15 hours behind me. So the only time he can do, um, is like 5 PM his time, which is like 7 PM, my 7 AM my time. So if, when I finish at two, I'm back up at six to work at seven. <laughs> so I just had calls this morning with him and I was just like, <laughs> but you know, it's part of it. Darren, your lifespan will, <laughs> will be to like 55 years old and then the cortisol will <laughs> kick in. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think maybe the opposite. I think because I'm not like doing loads of stupid shit, I could live longer, but maybe I could get that, get that wrong. No, no, I actually think, see when I look at you, from the outside in at least so when we've had like we've exchanged voice notes or we've called in the past you are someone who exudes happiness like you're always smiling it doesn't seem like your cortisol levels from the outside in at least mm-hmm. are as high as perhaps even like mine but there's far less work i think it's probably more sleep but you exude like such a vibrant way of life and maybe it's because you live in such a nice part of the world and your lifestyle outside of work is pretty pretty stress free mm, good Good point. Like I think, I think with everything though, man, like it's in ups and downs. You know, like you catch me in a meeting and I could be stressed out of my gills and a bit of a prick at times. But then, for the most part, you're trying to even it out. You know, so I think what I've learned from some of my mates though was that, like, I may have been like much more like irrational when I was younger, but I just try to keep like much more consistent pace throughout everything. And it's kind of like a kind of thing going around Twitter at the moment where it's like should you be going like as hard as possible when you can and then just relax then for the days you can't whereas like i think it's just like a consistent rhythm that you can keep up to and and, and do you know and you find that point between the like for me it's between 12 to 14 hours a day i can just i can still stay at it of course there's drops in between and i take a break and i go for a walk i do 12 thousand steps whatever but i think generally speaking that's like my point um and for someone else it could be more for someone else it could be less it's all individual based. You, you may notice in the, the upload schedule, and if I upload this part of the podcast, um, the listeners will notice as well. Like, I'm not, I've not uploaded in like three weeks because I've been doing the long hours, and then um, my professional exams through work, my Chartered Institute of Management Accounting exams come along. So I was already operating at like max bandwidth with all my other side projects. That when an, a, a new stressor enters my life, the whole construct just collapses so given the fact that you're working at 16 hour days right say something like i don't know another admin 
overhaul comes in that lasts a week long. Like you're working so close to the threshold that any more work it seems will just tip, will, will collapse the house of cards. Because well, that's what happened with me at least. Like, how do you manage the idea of an ad hoc um, situation occurring? Man, I, I, it's actually a great question. So, like, I had a lot of these happening in like the early days for sure. So, what used to always happen to me, especially in the earlier part of my career, was that. I would just go balls to the wall with something, like as you said, and then it would just be a tip of the iceberg. It would just be pushing a bit too hard. But what I try to do now is that I have my set rules of what I do, right? So I'm producing podcasts during the day. I'm doing it for other people as well. I'm doing my own show. I have content to do and I have my job to do. And my job, of course, will, will have its own parts to it. Then if I want to do something new, I need to be able to time block that and subtract something out. So this is where I was getting it wrong because I was adding stuff in. And if you picture it like a jar, in a jar, you can only add things in, but for it to be filled up to the top, something else needs to come back out. And now if you don't take something out consciously, it's going to spill over itself. And then you're going to end up burnt out, exhausted, resenting what you do and something that you enjoy doing, you're going to end up resenting. So for me, what I would try to do was like subtract something out. So I'll give you a very good example. I've produced like what, like 120 odd episodes myself. I've produced maybe 50 others for other people. I know how to produce episodes. I know how to produce them probably faster than most people because I've done it for so long. Because of that, I know that I'm able to, let's say, do one or two a week. Whereas before, I can only do barely one a week because I didn't know what I was doing. So now I have a bit more leeway. I have a bit more time to go do what I want to do and try to add in that, that aspect. So there's always that kind of like ramp up period of something extremely painful. And then there's a the cruise period. And then it's, you get to the point whereby you're saying, well, I can actually do more. And I think that's very true to like your personality or to my personality. You with your academic side of things is that you probably felt that, oh, you could add in you know, an extra level of complexity to learn more stuff in with everything with your career with your podcast with your personal life so it's the it's the jordan peterson approach as well isn't it just like the the, the heaven and hell the torture period whereby you're trying to get up to that period cruise and then you add something else into it 100 percent. on that point do you have a mechanism or a subconscious mechanism or conscious mechanism for prioritization an example that I might use is that recently, whilst balancing all of this, I've had some great opportunities, such as going down to London and presenting at work at mm-hmm. HSB so about my podcast. But realistically, besides a couple of new listeners, I didn't actually, from the outside in, merit that much success. Like, I didn't get paid for doing it. I didn't um, really network with anyone that was going to enhance my career to mm-hmm. a huge level. But it was such a glossy sexy experience and of course I was going to say yes to it do you ever have to manage or prioritize things like that and if so who do you do it so I think in the beginning early in your career you're a bit younger than me aren't you you're about 20 you're 24 25 I'm 20, 24 yeah earlier in your career you're just yes to everything you don't know what's good or bad or in between you just jump at everything just take everything and just grab it and just go do everything and if things spill over whatever you deal with that and move on I think as you get a little bit more experience in like the two years that we've apart, it's not worlds apart, but obviously there's a slight difference for sure. There should be, there, there should be a slight difference because there's two extra so. years. You know what I mean? That's, that's the goal. So at that point, I always try to prioritize in terms of what's the most immediate thing I really need to do. So let's say if it's work, a deadline, something that's coming around the corner, a big presentation, that's the, you know, non-negotiables need to be done today at a certain point. Then there is the kind of nice to have to what to get done. So produce a podcast on a Wednesday. If I get the editing done on a Sunday or a Monday, that's great. But if I don't, whatever, that's fine. Then there's all the other stuff. There's all the other potential opportunities. I think in the beginning, as you're not making that much money from speaking or whatnot, you can do them once they fit into your schedule and you can go take some time out, go to London. And it is a very good learning experience because you learn how to speak, interact with people, You'd be surprised people that you met in the room will come back to pay you dividends in three, four, five years. You never know how those things come back around. So I always try to do those. And I even think my partner as well has always said to me before, she was like, you spend so many times speaking at events, but you don't get paid for half of them. And I'm like, well, that's the whole reason why is because if you do them for long enough, then you will get paid for them. That's the kind of goal. So what I always say with this as well is that as long as it doesn't negate from the short term stuff you really need to do, which is your career, 
the deadlines, the the non-negotiables, let's say, everything else can be added in then as, as a result. And that's why, for instance, like if I'm meeting a lot of people in Singapore where I'm based, um, I try to meet people once a week, uh, network, meet new people. I try to meet one or two people a week. And this week I was like, fuck, like, you know, recording Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I was like, I'm going to put something in for next Monday, this morning, just set it up. I was like, hey, I'll come down and meet you in your office. Be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll go for a coffee. We'll chill out. I'm not going to get anything in return for that, but I'm just going to go meet people that I want to go meet. And as a result, I have time for that in the future because I'm kind of planning it in and baking it in. But what I feel that people can run into is that they think that they need the network, they need this, they need that, and they're not actually focusing on anything. They're just jumping around to different things. And different parts of your career deserve different parts of attention. I knew this preamble chat was going to be going down. That's why I hit record. <laughs> you remind me of when, when Rory Sutherland came on the podcast, he spoke about the public speaking industry. And he says the reason he comes onto podcasts, whether they're huge platforms or quite small platforms, is because he doesn't want to escape, escape velocity. So he says if you turn down perhaps one public speaking gig or one podcast, in fact, you turned in 1.8 because a lot of these things are based on referrals. 100%. So every, and I, like, so not just me, I'll give you an anecdotal experience. So outside of what I do, for anyone that knows, like I have my own agency, which is called KS Media, which was based off my podcast. So for a long time, I've been helping people with strategy and brand. And then we've gone into like full form production and it's got, it's, it's a big, it's a big gig, let's say, or right? there's a lot involved. I, before doing that, I spoke to as many, many founders who had done stuff like this. And I was like, how are you finding these leads, opportunities, new people, whatnot? Not one of them, not one of them said to me that they do outbound messages. Every single one of them said referrals. And I said, bullshit. I said, you should have a sales team. You should have someone always knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors. They said, no, trust me. It's just referrals. And I was like, weird. Anyway, after a while, when I started to get my own few clients, I was thinking, I need to start doing more sales. I need to start doing more sales. Pretty much zero people that have that have engaged <laughs> with me have been people that I have reached out to. It's always been people that have seen my podcast, have interacted with yourself, you know, friends of a friends and what whatnot. And that is the whole value of it. Same with my career. When I got into, um, we can go through that in a while, but all the application, all the jobs that I've had, I've never actually applied for. I've actually had inbound recruiters come to me and say, oh, look, we're looking for this product role or looking for this analyst role at the time, whatever. And I think that's such a funny way to look at things because we are all so focused on it's what I need to do. Whereas if you have these relationships and you interact with people, then a lot of these things just come naturally. It's like a universe theory. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it literally is. It's like the more you're willing to help other people or just engage or just learn from others, it will generally come back around full circle. Maybe not three months, six months, you know. It's funny how we talk about tangible assets or assets working for you in the background, like having passive income. But it's funny how this is almost like a form of that. Like the relationships that you create actually work for you when you're not around. Just mm. just like a digital asset, mate, or a stock and share, mate. People are talking about you and it's compounding and it's creating momentum behind your back. Um, as long as you're keeping the front end quite happy. And I remember... You know, of course, you never want to go down the, the, the podcast chatting about how we make a podcast route, but I want to give a good ex example of this. So you said about, you know, background work that happened. I had someone on my show, like, uh, I would honestly say nearly two years ago at this stage. Uh, great guy, bright guy, had a, had a huge podcast himself. A year and a half later, he reached out to me and said, I really liked how your podcast was designed. Any chance you can do it for me? He said, I could pay you on a three-month basis, six-month basis. I had never said a word to the dude. And it was just a fact that he and his co-host, he had a co-host, they were obviously like chatting, being like, oh, like we're running into a few issues, whatever. Oh, I was on a decent show. It was well produced, similar to yourself. All well designed, good cameras and stuff like this. And it just came back around full circle, which I thought was like wild, isn't it? Because we think, firstly, we think that we're way more important than what we are, which is true. But we also think that none of these relationships actually materialize, but they definitely do. And they definitely have a prosperous, uh, they all compound. It's compound continuously, isn't it? I have this theory that I wrote it down called you don't know 95% of the legacy that you've already created. And what that means is that as human beings, we don't proactively share how different experiences make us feel. We, we might 
recognise them internally, but we don't often actually share that with the individual. Like, when was the last time you read a piece of content and actually DM'd the content creator and said, I feel X, Y, Z about this. This is how I've actioned it or implemented it. Here's here's the outcomes. Or, or, or for example, if you go to a bakery and you get a croissant, you, you go down the street and you eat it. How often do you go back into the shop and say, that was an amazing croissant? You don't. You only receive like 5% of the, the, the feedback that you actually create for yourself. Mm -hmm. 95% of it's subcon not subconscious, but it, it remains in the brain uh, of the individual that experienced it. Um, and sometimes we don't get instant feedback on projects. Sometimes we don't get um, proactive communication on how our actions make other people feel. But it does exist, and it's, it's a reason to keep on going, I think. Mm. That's interesting. I have seen a lot about that as well, about people saying that, well, in general, you should kind of congratulate someone or say to someone when they've done something really well, especially in like the online space or a career aspect. Like People will often starve for feedback in their career, and then they wait, they roll around to one-year approval appraisal or uh, biannual uh, appraisal, and they get to that period, and they're usually left either unhappy or just you know pretty much level so it's interesting because we kind of crave that need for for validation at times and especially in the online space like with yourself or if anyone listening who's creating stuff just because nobody's responding or nobody's you know resharing something and saying how amazing it is doesn't mean it hasn't had the impact but i think a good litmus test which i always which i which is one reason why i kind of started like the online my whole kind of online stuff was like I remember hearing this this really famous kind of a was it online creator his name is Pat Flynn. Uh, one of the reasons why I started a podcast, great dude, and he was saying that basically the whole concept is that you're just trying to make one person make the difference for one person. So if you can help one person with a piece of content, technically it has the ability to make ten people happy, a hundred people, a thousand people, and potentially have that spiral effect. So when you get feedback or when you don't get feedback, you may have actually helped one individual. And that's kind of like as good as like anything else, you know? So then it gives you a good litmus to say that, well, you know, I'm not hearing that I'm getting the feedback that I particularly want, but I actually am helping other people because that's what I'm trying to achieve. So it's interesting. We often feel like we're speaking into a vacuum uh, and that, you know, whatever we want to do is like not being heard or whatnot. But it's a strange kind of dichotomy between like we need a validation, but we also need to help people and then be able to actually get a return on that which may, which is not financial, just mainly in terms of actual uh, validation. And I, I don't know quite the demographic of your listeners, but for me, there's a high percentage of it being male. And, Same. If, and, <laughs> <laughs> and if I were to like gauge, and it may be the same, given that you're the top performing careers podcast in Ireland, it may be similar to, to that of Scotland, where especially within... Um, men, we don't proactively share how things make us feel either. And it only takes me to go out a night out in my local town or in Glasgow and for someone to like recognise a podcast and come up to me and say, maybe I really like X, Y episode with Darren Lee, for example, this is how it made me feel. But they need to be drunk or they need to be like you know vulnerable to share that with me. It's just a cultural thing in, in Scotland. I'm not sure if it's the same in Ireland. It's exactly the same in Ireland. Now, I wouldn't say that hasn't happened to me often. It's been a long time since I've been in Ireland. But <laughs> um, for myself, I do find that like in that kind of self-development kind of space of like just personal development, whatever, whatever you want to call it, men in particular aren't willing to kind of be like, oh, like this may be a change or whatever. But that's not to say that it's not happening. Like my demographic is like 95% male. Um, and I feel like for a lot of people, whoever are listening to it, it's the people who do want to get something from it. So it's a good thing with books as well. You might find this that you'll turn to a specific book at a specific period in your life and learn a specific thing that is required for in this moment and nothing else. That's very similar to podcasts. And that's why what we kind of do or what I would consider my kind of podcast to be is kind of like when people like need the help in their career. It's like, fuck, I've been here like a year or two. I'm running dry. I don't know where my next options are. I don't know how to build a brand. I don't know how to get out there online. And that's kind of what I'm trying to like create and kind of distill so even though i might not get the same downloads as chris williamson people will come for a specific reason and then learn something from it whereas in contrast the other type of entertainment content which is nothing wrong with it is that that's where you have people on tiktok making like you know 
800k views or a million views on a random video but it's like what's the actual roi on that you know and uh, I, we may have seen it yourself with like youtube shorts or some of the, the short form content that you may have created on tiktok i've got a couple of tiktoks that have garnered like seven hundred thousand views really like, that's awesome ones. i don't know how, that hasn't really translated into seven hundred thousand podcast downloads has it like i think that that one episode has like a thousand one point five k downloads so I, I can't do the math off the top of the head, but they've not stayed around to listen to the full episode. Have they? Mm, and, and that's a big the, caveat with, with, with online work in general, though. True, true. But I think if you focus on, like, how many mates have you had or how many people have you have came to you and said, Darren, me and my mates always have these really good conversations. We think we could have a podcast. And they don't have, like, a mission statement. They just think chatting shit with your mate for an hour is the mission statement of the podcast. Whereas, like, like you said, you, your mission statement is people who are early on in their career looking for redirection or repurpose or mm-hmm. uh, a bit of guidance and they want to see options available to them. My podcast is using self-development, oh, sorry, using, come on, mission statement on there. My podcast is using uh, Genesis Stories as a self-development tool. So people come in to kind of hear a full person's life cycle or kind of an autobiography with me. Like they're very standalone mission statements that mm-hmm. people expect. But how many people come to you and say, Darren, me and my mate talk, talk shit for an hour. You think it's really funny or really insightful? Um, it happens all that? the time, though, man. Man, it happens all the time. But it, like the this is the whole longevity aspect of it, you know, without going into the podcast, like rabbit hole. We can if you, if you like, you know. But what's funny is that, you know, we have like, like 7% of podcasts stick around or something ridiculous. Like there's like two and a half million in existence, 150 or 1,000 or whatever are, um, are active. Now, with that comes a lot of this stuff. Like you have people who come in with an idea that they want to create like a fucking sex podcast or they want to create like something like this uh following like call or daddy or whatever but it just fizzles out and this is where it's interesting right because for the long term it all goes back to like are you actually interested in it and you can you do you actually have <coughs> some bit of like drive some bit of determination some bit of like actual interest in it and therefore you're able to do it for the long run that's the difference so for me it was all about solving the career advice from professionals in a non like professional sense, quite informal, quite relaxed, whatever, similar to yourself, bring it back to the origin. But it's funny, you have all of these things that hop up and down, they come in and out, come in and out, and they don't necessarily stick around because there's not actually much of a value proposition. It's the same in business, isn't it? Like the amount of people who hopped on like the NFT, like crypto shit last last year, like hopping on like any sort of thing, right? With zero idea about why they're doing it. Just because they think it's a short term gain. But I all my like approach to this and it's gone back like long into my days of studying, my early days in life is like never sacrifice long term goals for short term gain. It never works out. Ever. You always have to be focused on the long term on longevity of something, career wise, business wise, any aspect of life. Same with even training. Because the sh- the more you look for short term satisfaction, is the more you're gonna get burnt long term. What a quote. That last line was sick. Um, and on reflection, I think people look from the outside in and see, and I, I know you and I both hate talking about the mechanistics of podcasts on podcasts, but people from the outside in <laughs> see like the Stephen Bartlett's of the world or the Joe Rogan's of the world or the Chris Williamson's on the, of the world, and they see their monetary success from the podcast or what's the perceived monetary success of the podcast. But they forget that these people all had platforms before they actually started. Whereas some people think that's what got them there. So they think, well, I need to start a, a podcast to get to that level of fame. That must be the vehicle to get me to, a, to the destination. And they enjoy the destination and not the process. They love the product, but not the process. But mm-hmm. I know you, you and I both love doing this. Like we've mm-hmm. just hit record because we knew the preamble was going to be so much fun. And we love long form verbal content but some people try and use that as a, a, a as a token to get financial reward and that's not the case yeah like there there's no hiding in this you know that's what i want to say is that like whether you agree or disagree with what you say or what i i say there's no like hiding and there's no, no cuts there's none of that kind of stuff like even like a youtube video youtube is very difficult to crack you know i've done my best i've done my best to try to do it and i have massive respect for youtubers but they can redo things 101 different ways. They can get many different editors to do different things. But a podcast, you're going super long in it. And I think the difference is, is that 
a lot of people will phase off because they don't see the actual reward. And it's funny because like you put up a photo of like your abs on Instagram and you'll get like a thousand likes or a girl put up a photo of her ass and get a thousand likes. But if she or he creates a podcast, they might only get 10 downloads because people are not as interested in it, but it's all about the depth of what you're getting. So like the likes of Stephen Bartlett and stuff, I think, you know, him in particular, like they appeal to a different audience, you know, like they're looking at like, it's interesting right like they'll have a lot of downloads still but in proportion to the amount of stuff that they're putting up or like the amount of reach you're getting it's still the same as you and i maybe does that make sense it could be like a 10 percent attrition or a 10 percent conversion rate on that so it's quite interesting but i think how you can use podcasting or a better way to put it is that how you can use anything online for people and this is why i'm like a big advocate on posting online is that it all works in with the brand overall no matter how small how big it is it all contributes and it all trickles up so then when you go to let's say apply for a different job you wanted to move from your company to another company you have this podcast that shows a lot of things it shows you can build it shows that you are interested in what you're doing in your career it shows that you want to learn you're a voracious learner and you can use this as just a thing that you that you actually work on okay similarly with a business with a brand like i even had my, my girlfriend said to me the other day she was like you're just always on it when it comes to your podcast you're not taking time off you're not taking a break you're not going in and out of seasons just every week you're on it and the reason why is because with the business the businesses i have outside it shows this trust and reliability you know what i mean i'm not just sticking around for a bit there for the long haul here's the data here's the definition of it here's what we've done so far and we're not finished like we're very in the early stages like we're very very early on in our career and our and our journey in this so there's a lot more to come as well and you can also signal some of the guests you've had on are astronomical like Cheers, the man. amount of guests that you've, you, you've had on and, and the the profile of them you can cash that in for reward as well you can use their names to signal how great the podcast is because if if they trust, if they trust you to have an hour of their time, especially now that you're doing quite a lot of face-to-face ones as well, like if mm-hmm. you can cash that in for reward for future guests, you can signal to future guests um, that that you are a man of of trust, not only through the consistency that you have derived on the podcast, but the level of guests that you're currently getting on and the industries that they work in and the positions that they hold. Exactly. So I actually had a post r- around this the other day was saying about like you know, you can pretty much learn whatever you want from having a podcast. But what you can read between as well is that you can network with whoever you want. So probably the same as you, like I'm an extrovert individual, but I just hate the idea of going to a networking event. Like like I was at the FinTech Singapore event like a month ago. Now it was great. I loved it. But like, I don't want to tell people continuously every four minutes what I do. You know, it's just like not what I want to do. So those forced fun events just never really appealed to me it's kind of like if you got everybody from Twi- uh, from tinder and put them all in one room <laughs> it's like yes they will probably end up like chatting to each other but it's not like the best way to do it so that's why for me a podcast is so simple because it's on my basis take ownership of it it's on your cadence you're able to do whatever you want with it meet whoever you want and then build up that kind of brand around it and like to your to your point like as in of course like job opportunities are there investment opportunities are there for ideas you want to do in the future as well as just general learning so i can learn from pretty much anyone i want um and use it as a tool to learn more so it's leverage uh, and rightly or wrongly whether you agree or disagree that's what the digital era is about it's about leverage the more you do the more you get the more you better you get at it the better you can shoot for and then you have a better aspiration of what you want to do if you're starting off on day zero you can't say oh i want to interview Mike Tarson straight away. But if you stick out long enough, you hit along enough, maybe someone along the way can vouch for you and then you can end up and find yourself in that position. Does that make sense? It's like, it's kind of like we always just want things so instantly that where none of us are willing to do something and not get the reward instantly. And that's like the biggest like flaw of our generation is that none of us are, wa- are willing to wait until the reward. And that's, it's going to kill you. It's why we have so much people that are overweight. It's why we have people that are so disgruntled in what they do because they think continuously, I should get this reward right now. And none of them are looking at longer term. Could not agree more, mate. When I was doing a HSP giving a talk about the podcast, they asked the final question and they obviously banked it as the final question because it's such a final question in nature. They said, David, who is the dream guest that you would like to have on the podcast? 
I paused for like literally 30 seconds and said, I don't have one. Because what that means is that every next guest is nothing but a stepping stone to get me there. And it will yeah. discredit each individual guest because all they are stepping stones to get me to Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, or someone like that. Such a fucking good point, man. That's actually a great point because like you're you're only doing it for a particular reason then to get into some sort of like social circle or whatever. And that's not the goal, you know, like it's awesome to be able to speak to people along the way. But it's funny because actually I'm going to bring you back to that guy, Pat Flynn, again. So he has a podcast called Smart Passive Income. He has like 600 episodes and he's recorded with James Clear, uh, Tim Ferriss, like all, all, all the big boys. But what his actual most downloaded episode is from these two truckers, you know, like it's like American truckers who have like, like a fucking burger and like, like hot dog, like a hot dog truck in like the middle of like Arkansas. That's like his most downloaded because the people he met were just honest people. They had like a career in like corporate finance and then they just left it, bought like two trucks and they just drive it around like the, the Midwest and they make a shit out of money doing it. So that was like the idea for the podcast. I think that was really loosely it. And then as a result, anyway, he, that was like a very honest, great story that they learned a lot from. And as a result, it did really well. Now, it contrasts that to someone like James Clear, who's obviously like has a huge impact on the world. But having said that, if you got James Clear on your podcast and you're talking about Atomic Habits, I'm pretty sure you could find majority of it on the internet from his Google Talks, from his fucking book, from all the other stuff he does, does around it. That's not to discredit it. I'm saying that that's just a, a nuance of it. Whereas you have new people, discovery, meeting new people. And that's, that's, that's the nuance of life though, isn't it? That's like... That's like saying that I'm only going to go to London for vacation because I know that there's like good restaurants. Whereas you could end up in fucking <laughs> Holbach in the north of in the north of Mexico on an island with only carts, and you could have the best food of your entire life because you've completely discredited the other side of the argument because you think and you believe that this is the short term solution, and that's just true of all aspects of life. Oh, what a great point. And anecdotally, I've experienced that myself. There was one particular episode that I recorded with a woman called Jane McCary, who is an actor or actress in Scotland. She plays like a kind of minor part in a TV sitcom. And I recorded with her and I did not think for a second I was going to upload it. I thought, hmm, is this a great episode? Is she as big as my previous guest? I don't know if I want to post this. And this is when I was kind of following this hedonistic treadmill in terms of looking for bigger and better guests. I think Seth Godin was on like the week before. So I didn't want to have a kind of dip in name. And that, that was such a flawed mindset at the time, and I've corrected that. Uh, I'll hold my hands up to that. And now if I look on both YouTube and Anchor, it smashes Seth Godin at the park, and it's my most played episode. And that's because like if, if I were to listen to my Seth Godin episode, everything he said are on TED Talks. Everything he said... Or, or, or online, but this woman had never been really on a podcast and she told stories that were mm -hmm. so unique and so culture specific and mm -hmm. Scottish people absolutely loved it and ran away with it but for me I said I didn't think it had any weight or legs and I think I, I think that kind of demonstrates your point as well on a kind of definitely, level. Man. definitely and when you're talking about restaurant reviews uh, in, in London, for example, that is derived from something called preferential attachment. Um, mm -hmm. There was a, a study of Kickstarter campaigns where they took, say, 100 Kickstarter campaigns, donated $1 to 50 of them and $0 to, to 50 of them. And they tracked the level of investment over time. And all of the ones that were donated with $1 went on to varying levels of astronomical success. Whereas all the ones with zero donations at the beginning flatlined at zero so basically when it comes to trip advisor reviews you, you probably notice this yourself or you go to to leave one you go to for example flat iron steakhouse you think the meal was a three <clears> but you go on to trip advisor and you see other people are reviewing it a four or a five so you feel inclined to give it a four or five based on the past performance of other reviews and i mm -hmm. think that's what i think humans are so misled by that Man, there's a there's an interesting story on that as well. Uh, it was actually from Andrew Tate. He was saying that he had like a restaurant or he had like a cafe in uh, Romania, or else he was talking about how he would how he do it one or the other. But he was saying that basically, like you look at one coffee shop and you want it always to be at a point whereby it's not fucking empty, 
it's not full either there's always a cadence of just people coming through and coming through and coming through. It's like, there's always like two people that are like waiting to get a coffee and waiting to sit down because if there's nobody, people are going to walk across and say, shit restaurant, not going to go in there. If there's too many, they're like, Oh fuck, you know, it's too busy at the same time. You want to just at that kind of sweet point. And at the end of the day, the food could be shit and the coffee could be shit, but it has enough rhythm of people going through it, which is just wild, isn't it? So it's like, that's a good, that's a good example of like why some things just, are adopted by people but they're not necessarily the best think of social media how many apps have built been built and died a debt we don't actually know this because we don't know what they are that are social media driven apps that trying to beat facebook trying to beat twitter trying to beat instagram they're probably better on features there's no two ways about that twitter hasn't upgraded its front end in like eight years so of course it is but it didn't have the adoption because it didn't have the trust behind it so when you have a couple of reviews or when you have a bit of traction from it or when you have a vc pumping cash into it it gives that liquid that oh it's the group think effect and it's kind of like the the fucking zebra in a pack analogy like when you see a zebra out on its own you're like oh fuck not going to go near that but when you see it's part of a pack it's very difficult to distinguish and they could all be going in the right direction and that's what's very interesting it's just they're all going and they're all taken off whatever but if there's one that's outside it looks like a threat and then it looks like that someone can take it down. And that's what's very interesting about this is that like when you see one that like, stands on its own, it's bullshit and no one's going to follow it. But when it's all moving in the right direction, which is why you have the likes of Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, um, Twitter, all moving together. That's like the weird kind of, it's another kind of dichotomy, isn't it? It's like how we trust things and how we put our faith in other, in other aspects. It reminds me of survivorship bias. Have you heard of that bias before? Where, like, an example of that is where we think so the, the greater, like, the, the killer whale, not the killer whale, the great white shark is the most deadly shark. But that's only because so many people have survived attacks from a great white shark. Whereas in the deeper parts of the ocean, there's more deadly sharks. But the people that have been attacked by them are not around to tell the tale. Mm -hmm. It's only because people have been able to survive and, and come back and tell the tale that we denote that shark to be, the, like, the most dangerous. And like you said, other app, apps could have way better features and there's so much to learn from them. But because they don't exist any longer and no one's using them, we can't recall and collect information and feedback from them to develop further apps just because they haven't stuck around to survive. It, so it's the exact same for traveling, man. You know what I mean? It's the exact same. Like people say, oh, like you shouldn't go here because it's dangerous or you shouldn't go there because like it's like, you know, like an honor again, it's dangerous or whatever. The reason why is because like somebody had some sort of a fucking encounter and it posted on Facebook or some bullshit. And then you get there and you're like, whoa, this, this is perfect. I'll give you a very good example. The Philippines has a reputation for being dangerous. Okay. So obviously I was going there like recently enough. I was there like two months ago and everyone's like, it's dangerous. And I was like, firstly, it's not fucking dangerous. It's dangerous if you want it to be dangerous. If you want to show up and do loads of illegal shit, wherever you go on any corner of the earth, it's going to be dangerous. Showed up there. Everyone super welcoming, very, very community driven wise, very helpful, very kind, very much like there to be helpful for some, for you to have a great time. That's kind of like a great way to put it. And some of the islands are like absolutely beautiful and I couldn't recommend them more. You look it up online and it says, oh, it's very dangerous. And that's why you it's clouded by one person's perspective. And then it's a small minority have the vocal uh, tone then and as a result and they take the majority which is a very poor way to like live your life because you're always succumb to what is the perception of things uh, and that's where you go into all different issues of why you shouldn't live here or shouldn't be dating that person or that person or this person and all of that is based on just like a small minority at, at the beginning that's where it began from and then it took precedent and then it kind of grows and takes tails. And that's a contagion in itself. Like that's actually the concept of a contagion is the idea of something that small grows and then it dilutes your own beliefs, which is like exactly the opposite of how you should live your life. I, I love that, the analogy of it being a contagion. And I think entrepreneurs and people like you and I who are perhaps visionaries to some degree we are probably outliers of that because we recognize if we're going to do what they did, we're probably going to get what they got. 
<laughs> and, uh, uh, literally, like if you, I always think about that because if you, if you go through life wanting something different, but you do what everybody else does, you are going to end up the exact same. <laughs> now it goes the same for jobs, for your career, for your life, for your health. Like if you go out on a Friday get slaughtered, wake up on a Saturday, eat like Domino's pizza and shit, you will end up looking and feeling like everybody else. It's great, right? If you're going into a job and you want to get paid a lot, okay? So when I was very young, I uh, didn't have a lot of money. Parents are very, very ordinary. Um, and one of my goals was just always to be able to be very, very financially ahead. It's always a goal. When I went into a lot of companies, I remember just looking up, seeing like managers and managers and saying, what the fuck? These guys are barely getting paid pretty much for their age, like 30 years old and they're earning like 80K. And I was thinking, I was like, well, that's not a route I want to go because if I stick doing what I'm doing, I'm going to end up there. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I should have done something differently. Does that make sense? So you're a, you're a fucking product of your environment. And if, if everybody else is thinking the exact same, you got to do something different. And it can start small. Start small. Get fit. Get super healthy. Make that your priority. And Colin, like our good friend Colin, which I'm looking forward to meeting on New Year's Eve, um, you know, he, he made a great point that I'll always remember this, that when he's working and he works in an office two days a week, if he gets up with his gym bag to go to the gym or he might have, let's say, a pre prep meal or whatever, people are like, oh, fuck, you're like really, really healthy. Like, do you ever like take a break for yourself, whatever? And he's like, no, 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 this is how I pay myself. I pay myself this in like, this is my, this is my payment to myself to be healthy. And as a result... The guy is, what, a 29 now at this stage, shredded as fuck, super healthy, always on top of his game. So he did that detachment from reality, and now he is the outlier, which is stranger again, because being healthy shouldn't be the outlier. Being healthy should be the standard. And then that's used as a baseline for everything else, and it's the exact same in the business space or the podcast space. If you show up and just do the basic shit, basic results. If you push really, really hard, short-term pain for long-term gain, in that period, then it's going to be horrific because a lot of the time you're often on your own. Like when I was building um, my agency in the beginning, I had a clue what I was doing, not a clue what I was doing, but I remember just being like, I'm in the weeds, in the weeds, just keep going, just keep going. Just like keep pounding in the doors, keep seeing where it goes. Because the funny thing is that I didn't know anybody doing it. So a lot of the time I, I knew of people, but I wasn't going to contact them and be like, how do I solve this? So I was like, because there isn't a fucking Reddit thread on how I should do this, that means I'm probably on the right fucking path to some degree. So it's weird, man. It's like, you know, you'll, you'll notice yourself as well. Like same guys who were in the same bars when they were 18 years old, texting the same girls, doing the same shit in the exact same position six years later. And I can't look into the future, but I guarantee you do another six years. I guarantee you, 80% of those dudes that were in the bars on the first day are still back and then he thereafter goes ending up with some of those girls. That's just like the reality. And that that's a small that's a small town effect, man, in a fucking nutshell. I wrote a tweet the other day, and by the way, I, I want to add a testament to Cull. That is the most Cull quote <laughs> that I've ever heard in my life. And you say like, yeah, people people should be healthy, but that 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 man is beyond healthy. He is he is so disciplined. He is in incredible shape. Both but it's it, it's sick though, isn't it? Like it's sick 100%. to look at that. And like I, I I try to like mirror a lot of the stuff he does because that's the reason why that's what a friend is. Like you look at someone and you're like, fuck, this is sick. I want to get to that level. And I look at that and I'm like, he does that really for himself at this stage. Like he's not doing that for someone to fucking say. Like he just gets shredded because he wants to get shredded. And then he just he's in really good shape. And then when he's not being super lean he's also super healthy and always on top of it and to be honest i sorry i think i spoke to you previously that i've haven't drank for six months one of the reasons why i stopped drinking was because of colin because he didn't drink for like i don't know what it was like a year or two years oh, or whatever yeah, yeah. and he, he said it to me and then i was like i was like what the fuck am i doing and so i was like and then he was like oh i just you know i just didn't want to lean into like what everybody else was doing and then i was like I don't want to lean into what everyone else is doing too. <laughs> I was like, I don't know why I'm doing this. And I like did a massive audit of my life. And I was like, what are the things that are like really turning the needle? Like what's really helping my life? What's really like health wise, relationship wise, money, everything. What's turning the needle? What's pulling me back? It's looking at other people, drinking alcohol, 
um, fear of missing out, which is kind of goes into both of them, and trying to live a career that someone somewhere created that some 26-year-old should be doing, which is absolute trash, bear in mind. And I'll, and I'll tell you, from experience, being in like a senior role at my, at my age, like it's not like you get happier from being in the role. Like the role stays exact same. So that should just be a that should just be a standard that like you can be a senior this or, or manager of that or or whatever. But you're still going to be unhappy if you're an unhappy person. You know, there's that's the basis for a lot of this stuff. On that, I want to ask you a question that I know we did because we just went off the cuff, and it's very aligned with this. I fucking love this tweet that you put up, and sorry for swearing to the listeners, but this was an epic tweet. It was how your environment is designed and how that's conducive to your quality of life. You mentioned five pillars, social, physical, professional, health, and attitude. I think that was a great tweet. It's something I, I, I really agreed with. Could you perhaps walk us through the five pillars, starting Definitely, with social, man. for example? Definitely. So I think social kind of goes back to what we were saying about Colin and stuff, that you know, if you go through your 20s and your friend group is the exact friend group you went to high school with, you're fucked. Just playing up, you're fucked, right? Because that just means that you haven't adjusted in any way. You were formed by because your parents threw you into a school and this is your this is your friend group forever. You're fucked. Not to say you shouldn't be friends with them, but your uh, your interest should, should change. You should be around people that are in your industry, that are around where your career lies, where your interest lies, where your hobbies lies. That should be your new stuff, right? If you're into bodybuilding, whatever, you should have bodybuilding friends. That's how that works. Then on the other stuff in terms of environment and location, like I'm a big proponent. I know people have different scenarios. People may not be able to move for certain reasons, but if you have the ability to get out of your small town, just go, right? Because there'll come a day when boy, you might need to take care of your parents or whatever that is, and you might need to go back and take care of them. But in those, uh, in that aspect of time, I would get yourself into the biggest city you possibly can with ambitious people, try get a decent role somewhere, uh, like, don't get nine dollar espressos, okay? That's not worth it. Just get go to Seven Eleven, get one for one dollar. Like, find ways to stay in these cities because that is where the money is, and that's where the opportunity is. That's where the, that, that's that's where everything is. If that's exactly like Singapore, everyone's like, "Oh, Singapore is so fucking expensive." It's because you go to a restaurant at the weekend and spend two hundred and eighty dollars on restaurant on, on food. Of course, it is. Right? You can go and you can go to Glasgow, man. Spend that money on food as well. If you want to go do it, you can do it. I never eat out, never doing that shit in Singapore for that exact reason. Next aspect then is mainly around company. So I think company is a very interesting one, and I know we can go down like a huge rabbit hole around career. But I and I do a lot of discussions on this with people, and I think the biggest issue for young people is that they'll go to career, they go to companies that they are recommended by other people, friends, family. Never take advice from your parents. Ever, unless your parents are literally millionaires who have grown their own companies, never take advice from them just because they're trying to protect you. They will pick the safest route for you. They'll pick one that, <laughs> that does not align to what your interests are. You should, at an early stage or or when, where, whatever part you are in your career, find companies that align towards your interests. For me, I'm working in Revolut. I like to move really fast. I like to not wait around for things. I'm very impatient sometimes and I need to have that upward growth. Revolut offers that for me. As like someone who's creative and kind of entrepreneurial, they're a, they're a company of entrepreneurs now. I'm not trying to pretend like I'm at that stage. A lot of those guys have built and grow, built and sold startups and I've gone into Revolut. So it was a great place for me to get in. I actually got lucky, to be honest, to get in there because there was a recruiter who was Irish that reached out to me at the time. I think that had something to do with it. But anyway, so company matters, right? Then your lifestyle as well is super important. Like as you mentioned, like... I work long days. I enjoy working. I enjoy my career and I enjoy what I do. That does not mean that it's easy. It is very difficult and it is stressful. And sometimes, let's say my girlfriend might bear the grunt of it because I could be grumpy or whatever. Your lifestyle design in terms of like what you actually do supports all of this mission. So again, healthy, get all that shit in check. But then in terms of everything else, if you're working to live for the weekend so you can go get plastered, you're screwed. You're just fucking screwed, right? So one on the anxiety, the stress, the sleep aspect, you're screwed, right? And people always say, like, you know, like investment banking, whatever, like they're always like out and stuff like this. I don't give a shit, you're screwed, right? That's just the way it is. Longer term, long, long enough time horizon, you're screwed. Get that in order 
at the weekend. Don't be doing stupid shit. Like if you want, if you're going to pick your moments, pick your moments. Like I was in, I, the last time I drank was in Ibiza in one week in Ibiza. Haven't drank since probably go back to Ibiza next year. I might have a drink or two then. Does that make sense? As in that you're trying to get your, your, your lifestyle in order when all that is put together, it all comes together and it moves in the right direction. It is not a boring life. It is a fulfilling life. It is doing something that is long-term driven that is not getting all this dopamine hits continuously and you're looking for satisfaction with other people and it sets you up in a nice position the output of that is you making a lot of money in your 20s you setting yourself up in a great position to either go to a different company that's let's say for you like mckinsey or whatever for me it could be a small scale startup or it could be building a startup whatever but you put yourself in that position by by doing all this hard work and a lot of people say like Oh, like in your 20s, you should kind of set your career up for your 30s, whatever. That's true. But a lot of people who do that spend seven years or eight years in a terrible company that just barely moves as slow as erosion. And as a result of that, they just do not do that. They don't do not set themselves up properly. Whereas if you're creating your life properly, whereby you're consciously looking at where your lifestyle is, where your health is, where your career is, where where the money, where's the money at? Like where like who's making the money? Because someone's making it. If you're not doing it, someone else is doing it. And then you'll find yourself at 30 years old making 150, 200k, 300k a year easily, like as in like fucking easily at that stage. Because it's all set up correctly. And again, you go back to someone who you can trust. You're someone that people can put a finger on, that people can rely on. And what's funny is that a lot of the stuff that's happened to me recently, people will ask me like, oh, can you do this? As always, sell the dream, sell the dream, sell the dream. I can do anything. You ask me to do something, I can do fucking anything. And then you learn to figure it out. But because you've done it like 50 fucking times, you can just go do it again. Does that make sense? So you, so it's, a, it's the idea of breaking down a problem and solving it. And you get that by dedicating time to this process of breaking it down. Some have different levels of complexity, different levels of complexity, reinforce different ability to go and actually be able to do it but at the end of the day it's about being able to do this but if you're not if you're not setting yourself up correctly you will never get into those positions like it's just it will never happen you can pick people that you know you grew up with and they're never ever going to get into those positions because they're not putting themselves out there Aaron, do you know what my recent toxic trait is it's when podcast guests come on and say something as profound as that and i i i, I react by saying <laughs> I react by saying that's going to be my podcast clip. That's going to be my trailer clip. I mean, that is going to be my trailer clip because that was that was solid advice. I, I love that. And if I were to add, perhaps either a reflection or add another facet to to that uh, framework, perhaps consumption, like is another one, like what you consume, uh, mm-hmm. and, and and typically that's not just food and tangible things, but intangible things such as content. Yeah, you, 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 I, it's so cliched, but the whole statement around you're the five, pe- you become the average of the five people you hang around with. That's not just physical; that's also digital role models. It includes the podcast that you listen to, or the author that you read, or the YouTube content creator that you consume, or the Instagram influencers or content creators that you follow. That they are part of your wider inner circle, and hundred percent, you gravitate towards their their outcomes, or mm-hmm. perhaps, for example. Andrew Tate, right? Contentious guy. I listened to a podcast with him and he was very extroverted, very controversial. I think it was James Smith actually that hosted him or it was on a podcast with James Smith. And then offline. I listened James to that Smith. one like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so James James Smith did a reflection of that on an Instagram story and he said actually Andrew Tate turned on a character for that podcast. He wasn't actually like that. So if we take that model and um, exacerbate it. Perhaps some of the content creators that we consume online aren't actually authentically them, and because we let them into our our inner inner circle, we're beca- we're we're slowly becoming them or mirroring them, even though that they're only doing that to provoke an emotion and provoke an outcome. So they're not actually realistic archetypes, but we're so then we're exposing to unrealistic archetypes when those people are not actually being that character in day to day life. It's the caveat to life, isn't it? So I think, I I agree with you. I agree. I think a good way to baseline that, okay, so I don't know much about that James Smith scenario, but what I do know is that, like, Andrew Tate is wildly successful. Whatever way I look at it, like, controversial, not like, guy made a fuckload of money, 
the guy has like proper freedom like he bounced back incredibly well from this this censorship stuff whether you like him or not like my my personal preference is that i think he's very helpful like even for me he's someone that helps me just be driven be focused trying to actually achieve something so he bounced back like really well so regardless of what he's like offline completely there's instruments you can take let's look at another example rob Lipset, irish bodybuilder so i was following him from when i was very young like 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 i mean like 17 18 he was very small at that stage people in ireland love to shit on him they love to shit on him i from the very beginning loved him i thought he was very driven very focused he was very much an american style bodybuilder the way he created himself his marketing was very good now in the back of my head i knew he wasn't always like that like 24 7 on top of it but i knew the guy was very healthy i knew the guy was he backed himself a lot he had great confidence and they were the things i wanted wanted to mirror and then you take yourself in then into some other aspects like you know, justin welch is on my podcast um huge influence on, on my entire life to be honest and someone like that um again may not always be completely thinking in terms of systems and content and audience whatever but i learned the small aspects from it so even people listening to me now today you know you don't need to go and fucking jump out a window and change your life 360 or 180 degrees but it's kind of like objectively looking at it and thinking like okay so darren was working in a career that he absolutely despised he is now doing something that he kind of likes a bit more he's trying to get there to somewhere else maybe maybe there's some truth to that that i can use for my own life let's take the fact that majority of people are unhappy in their roles that's that's a great statement but that's a very true statement which is very reflective of society and taking that as an example well maybe it's time we look a little bit more inwards because someone like me who does this very thoroughly and very regularly has made those adjustments so i think you know long story short we do need these influences but we need to just take small aspects from them and i think that's why the younger generation get very involved with it so predominantly girls who are very emotional or there's something an emotional reaction to a lot of a lot of things they could be following other girls who are really beautiful botox like everything and they're like oh i need to get to that stage you know i, I need to be that like 17 8 year old 18 year old girls highly impressionable that's of course dangerous and toxic so it's only until those girls get a little bit older and they think oh you know i'm happy with my nose i'm happy with my cheek whatever i don't necessarily need that and they become much more comfortable in their skin so there's those aspects but i think uh, what I've done in that scenario is cleaned out everything, everything. So my LinkedIn, I linked into my main platform that I use, click onto it. I'll have the same guys every day that are on it. They're all people that I, um, what's the word I'm trying to use? I've properly created myself. So I only you, look at that. You've them, haven't you? I've, I've, exactly. And then in terms of Instagram, so I kind of had like a mental crisis in Instagram recently. I was thinking, I was like, I, I was like, who are these people? I don't want to follow someone that was 16 year old, like a 16 year old I drank like alcohol with at like a party like 10 years ago. I don't want to follow them on Instagram anymore. I was like, I don't give a I'm glad fuck you said 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was literally, it was literally, it was literally like 10 years ago, like at like a house party. I was like, at, like halfway through school, like underage drinking, bear in mind. And I'm like, why do I follow these people? Like these people have no value to my life. Not to say they're not valuable in general. They can go off their own career, but they have no input on my life. Cut them. Fuck it. Cut it. Get it all out clear it all out and then only have a selection of people that I'm friends with uh i like i learn from and what whatever and that's a hard it's a hard pill to swallow because it's like you're holding on to like a past life when you're doing it for some reason like for some reason there's something going off in your head and you're like i can't really get rid of this but then it's like all of this is bullshit because none of them like none of them are there to support you number one because they're just over there if you go on the internet so anyone who's not there to support you and is just there just judging you or whatever Cut them, let them go, and then create your own feed. Then from it, Colin gave me this advice as well. If you're scared to face repercussions of doing that, which you shouldn't be, uh, I haven't been. He says the simple low hanging fruit is just to mute them. If you don't want to unfollow them, just mute them so you don't see their stuff. And he gave me that advice um, a couple of years ago or a year ago, and I said, Nah, mate, I just unfollow them. I'm quite ruthless with it. And then <laughs> I was once out on a night out, or I was out getting a meal and my local town and someone came up to me and said 
like almost in tears asking me why I unfollowed them and thought I was like their best mate. But but that's why you unfollowed them. If you cry because someone unfollowed you, you deserve to be fucking unfollowed. Like that's the way <laughs> that's the way I look at it. Like isn't like if you have an app, if you, so there's the the day is difficult. Okay, no matter if you work a shit job, a really good job, a high paying job, a low job, the day is difficult for everyone. If you put time into looking at these fucking apps to see who unfollowed you, you deserve to be unfollowed. That's the way I put it. <laughs> if you're sitting there refreshing to see the latest negative news, then I'll be at the top and I'll be the person that's unfollowed because it's bullshit. Like that, that surely is not how we should live our life. hundred like, percent. You know, <laughs> it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if you had a party, you were having a party and you invited 150 people to your house. And one person was like, oh, this is kind of shit. I'm going to go to a different party, walk to the front door. Would you sit there crying because the person left? No, you wouldn't. That's the exact same to like this like online digital space. But it's just sad though. Like, as in, like, in terms of like thinking, like, who would be there sitting at the other end looking at this through a vortex, thinking, like, oh, God, this person doesn't, doesn't, doesn't care. And it's like, yeah, they don't. Same with your podcast. Like, not everyone should like it. Only people that need to learn from it should, should like it. Same with your business. Like, you don't. You don't like create a business so that everybody can benefit from it. You know that's not the goal. Like the benefit is that like structured. You have a target audience, target target market. That's the whole goal. That's how you should create a lot of your life. You know. Yeah, I think to some degree, aiming to be likable or agreeable is such a negative way to live. Mm-hmm. I think that's- you should aim. You should aim to be disliked because it means that you stand for something. It's a whole. It's such a cliched statement, but it's like if you was it if you stand was it, was it, if if you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. Hundred percent. That's a Jake Paul scenario. Like Jake Paul is like the biggest cop out of all time because he just like he just he's everything. He's like the crypto guy. He's the NFT guy. He's like a pump and dump guy. You know, he just like he just has like his managers give him something, and as a result, then he'll just run with it. So those people like generally don't stand over anything. So I think it's it's very telling in, in your in your in your life as well because it was actually a great on my podcast. I recommend it to you as well, um, Ned Phillips. Great, for anyone who's listening, not just my podcast, just in general, he's a he's a fantastic guy, a huge influence on my life. The guy moved to Hong Kong when he was like nineteen. He's from Glasgow. He's actually from Glasgow, somewhere in Scotland, somewhere in Glasgow, Scotland. He moved to he moved to Hong Kong back in like the eighties. It wasn't even fucking Hong Kong then. And he was doing like door to door insurance sales, proper like entrepreneur, like sales guy. Then he ended up working on a trading desk. God knows how he ended up there. And he's on a trading desk in Hong Kong. A guy walked in one day and was like, I'm going to run a hundred miles. Does anyone want to do with me? It's tomorrow. He goes, I'll do it. Fuck it. So ever since then, he was like 21 years old. He's been an ultra marathon runner since. The guy could not give a shit who's looking, why they're looking, what the benefit is. He just gets out there once or twice a week. He does these super super long walks or runs. He now at fifty five years old uh, was on the Singapore national team for backyard ultra marathons and did twenty nine hours. He ran for twenty nine fucking hours. This guy. The reason why? Back in the day, when someone said he wanted to do an ultra, someone said they were going to do an ultra marathon, he just said, "Fuck it, I want to do it." Couldn't give a shit what someone said. That's opened so many doors to him. He's now CEO and founder of a company called Bamboo. They're a robo advisory based in based in Singapore. Hugely successful company. Uh, and he's all this other aspect to him. I could walk down the street and I could ask a random person of finance, do you know Ned Phillips? They say, yeah, I know what to do. Because he just went off and did it. And now he's that dude. He's the dude that runs all the miles. Not because he's the dude that tried to get other people to happy with him. Same with yourself. You do this long enough, you'll just be the podcast dude. You and Colin are the Glasgow po- uh, podcast guys. You didn't do it because some girl said it was a good idea. It was terrible <laughs> to do anything. You did it because you thought it was a good idea and then it, it came back to benefit you. Shout out Ned Phillips. I want to check out that episode. That sounds sick. Check out the dude. Man. T- tell him I sent you. He's, he, he's a great dude. Great guy. The definition of an outlier. I want to ask a quick question around the 9 to 5 or the concept of the 9 to 5 or the, the concept of the office job. Right now, Instagram's telling us to, to quit our day job and go balls to the wall on entrepreneurialism. And if you don't, then you're then you're average, or you're like everyone else. But in fact, I know you're you're a proponent of a of a corporate job. You have one yourself. Should everyone leave their nine to five, or do you think a nine to five can give you purpose and meaning and has benefits to you? Two questions in there. 
Firstly, should everyone leave their 9 to 5? No, because some people are destined to work 9 to 5. They don't want to do anything else. That's just the reality. Not everyone can handle extreme press, pressure, um, not have the reliability of a reoccurring revenue coming through or you know, like a salary. People can't handle that. People can't handle that pressure. More so people snooker themselves. People, there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a fallacy that we should get a mortgage and have a kid before we're 30 or when we're 30. For some reason, someone said that was a good idea. That also snoo- snookers you and puts you into the golden handcuffs. So I don't think it's for everyone. But what I do think is that there's nothing wrong with having a nine to five. As long as you're doing something that's actually engaging, you're getting paid for it. Now, you can look around a lot of different companies, a lot of big companies and stuff like this. And what I like to say is that if you measured output, or let's say just like general effort, measured effort from like one to 10 scale, majority of people are operating between like a six and an eight, majority of people. But even people who operate within a six and an eight, the distribution of how much money they're making is wildly different. Take someone that's in like compliance or take someone that's in like legal, compare that to someone who's in trading, compare that to someone who's in product, apples and oranges, completely different. So I think if you're going to work a nine to five, position yourself in the best way possible. Get yourself a role that is going to make you a lot of money either one day or or soon, hopefully soon, to be honest. And you understand that trajectory. The concept that, oh, we should just like, like as in the safety and whatever is not true. Like, like we should know this by now. Like all the tech companies are laying off people from Twitter to Stripe to Facebook, whatever. There is no like reliability. And that's just, that, that, that should, that's a feature, not a bug. That's the reality of the world is that we don't have reliability from it. If you think that's reliable, you're being fooled. Okay. So you should have that as a caveat but you can still progress really, really, really well on it. I think that people's interests evolve over time. So as I said in the beginning about people not beco- not natural entrepreneurs or shouldn't be, I feel the opposite can also happen. People who start in a career can find so much pain from it because it's so slow that they just roll themselves out into being an entrepreneur. And that's kind of what, why it, what happens. And the inverse also happens. That's why you see a lot of people who are founders who end up in companies because they started it smart as fuck, solve a lot of problems. They can sell, they can market, but they can't keep it sustainably up for a long period. So they want to go back working a proper career, whatever, and have that small bit of reliability. Then when it comes to your actual career, so that's kind of the first question. The second question then is that I do think that a big proponent of how you have build a successful career is the passion, purpose, and fulfillment trifecta, if you will. Now, I learned all of this from uh, Man's Search for a Meeting, from Viktor Frankl, because I was really, really, really at a bottom part of my career. So a bit of backstory, um, studied business information systems when I was younger, which is like half engineering, half business kind of focus, how I describe it. Um, broke my back to get like really, really high grades. I'm not one bit intelligent in any way. I just put my head against the paper until I, until I learned enough from it. And I ended up in, I did many different jobs, but then my grad role was from uh, Accenture. When I was in Accenture, it's a good analogy. It's like, it's just not for everyone. Your pitch shot, it's for everybody, but it just wasn't for me. So that's when I went into this trough of despair and essentially depression, like a depression, depression style, like uh, outlook, whereby I was like, Jesus Christ, if I did all this work and I ended up here, then wow, what's in it for me next? You know, like, well, where am I going next? What's, what's next job? Roll from here so i think then i was able to look at what brings me enjoyment what do i think has a value what do i think actually provides value for other people and that's why revolut looks like a really good option because revolut it's big in the uk but it's huge in ireland huge there's you know everybody uses it in ireland i could see a really good benefit from it i saw a problem that i was solving which is that a lot of irish banks are uh put it bluntly are, are pretty poor and it was somewhere that I could learn so much from the greats, like the greatest people coming out of JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, the, the best startups, whatever I could learn the most from it. So I was like, okay, I'm on this passion, purpose, fulfillment journey again. And it's also paying me. Does that make sense? So, you know, I feel like that people don't think deeply enough about these things. And then they become a victim of their own surroundings because they think, well, you know, and now I have to say fuck the nine to five because I'm not happy in my job as this. But it's like if you took responsibility, 
you could have made way more money, stayed nine to five, had none of the pressures of having to build your own company, and lived a pretty decent life. I I resonate with those symptoms and outcomes myself. Um, when I look at organisations, and I think it's a gentleman called James McGregor Burns, there's two types of two types of leadership: transactional and transformational. Transactional, there's a trade for reward in exchange for services and compliance, and that's kind of typical old school manufacturing kind of roles. Um, and then there's transformational, which sounds the kind of style of Revolut, KPMG, where I work, where the culture is inspiring or the leadership is inspiring and, and motivates others to work at levels beyond their competencies. Mm-hmm. And I think where, where you work, definitely where I work, I can take my side hustle. So I obviously have side hustles with the podcast. I can take that, the lessons I've learned there, and mold them into my work at KPMG definitely, and push, push the boundaries a little bit and kind of redefine the job spec to some degree. And I think that's mm-hmm. actually a bug of many people's careers that they, they apply for a job that has a predicated job spec. They present only that version of themselves in the interview. So that's what they're rewarded on once they join. But in fact, they're much more than the job spec that was outlaid. And if you can present that within the organization, you can start pushing boundaries and, and redefining your role. And that add values to your employer. That different way of thinking add values, add, add value to the employer. 100%. 100%. So in my role in Revolut, so my main role is product owner. So like build products, own, I own a product, the, the trading product. But my main kind of split from that is engagement. So it's engagement of the features. So basically making the features like actually decent so people want to use them. And I actually had a conversation with someone last week about content strategy that was based from a podcast formula and how that can be applied to product engineering and product design. And it was the exact formula of how podcast content works and how that works the exact same. Man, at the end of the day, it's just eyes on a screen or sound in the ear. You know what I mean? There's a level of retention and and holding people's attention and, and getting them enjoyed and getting them to be, you know, uh, promote your business as a result. So there's all these transferable elements. And that's why it's so funny when someone's like, oh, I can't do something. And that's like my biggest word that I hate the most is that I can't do something. And that's why it frustrates me when I struggle with something. Because if I'm, for instance, like I'm not very technical, but a, a technical from an engineering perspective, let's put it that way. But I do put my head in to try to get stuck under the hood. And if I can't get it, I'm trying to improve on it. But I can't. it's not that I can't do it. I just need to work harder on it. So it's funny because when people want to start like a side hustle or whatever, they say, oh, I couldn't do that. Can't do that. Whatever. That's bullshit. You can do it. You're just not willing to stick your head hard enough on, on the fucking keyboard of your laptop until you come back out to other solution. And my girlfriend's a great example. Like she super entrepreneurial, super creative, like really just like can just do anything, like puts her mind to anything and just do it. And like has a very successful online business, e-commerce store has fuck all idea about e-commerce before she started it. But she looked up and was like, could probably do this. Could take me a while <laughs> learning from it. And then we'd be sharing ideas. We'd be having breakfast. And I'd be like, oh, like, you know, you could like put it like this. And she's like, why, why is it like that? And I'm like, well, from a product perspective, it has to read like this. And then she's like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, from a copywriting perspective, she looked at this. And then we're kind of going back and forth. It's like a jigsaw. It's like a massive jigsaw they're putting together. And then that's like the element of a creative career is that it's just like a jigsaw that you're slowly putting together. Whereas a fixed career is like, ah, oh, I'm an accountant. And then someone's like, well, you need to send this invoice. And it's like, no, 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 I'm the accountant. It's like, no, 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 no. You need to do other things. Otherwise, we're not going to give you the 80K, the 100K, the 120K that you actually said you wanted. So there's always that kind of struggle with people, I, I feel. I, I'm not sure if many businesses are, are, are approaching this new adaptive model, but what I think will be the valuable skills of the future, the, the valuable career model of the future, well, let, let me tell you what I think the current one is, right? You join an organization into a, a specific role, for example, an accountant, which is a highly regulated industry. It's the same with um, financial same with technology, fintech. I guess. Yeah, fucking so, crazy. So, yeah. so you're told to conform because you're regulated. You're told to be quite conservative and risk adverse in nature. You follow a job spec, you're handed duties, you fulfill them, and you don't see beyond that. And you follow that model until you get to, like, for me at KPMG, partner. 
or perhaps director or someone quite senior within Revolut. And then you're told to be entrepreneurial, but you've had that squeezed out of you for the last 10 years. Because it's like a wet, like- wet t-shirt, man, squeezed out of you. Like I, I, I would use the analogy of like a funnel like, um, or like blinders. If you look at like a, like a horse, okay, the blinders off on a horse, he'll fucking go anywhere, right? He'll run anywhere, he'll stamp on anyone. That's an entrepreneur. Whereas when you put the blinders on, the horse will only go in a straight direction. And then if he has blinders on and there's a sound, he shits his pants and loses his mind. That's what happens because you're getting so focused in on something. And then they're like, oh, well, now you got to create some new roadmap, whatever. Like you have no idea about how to do it. But again, back to solving problems. If you genuinely like are in a search of solving problems and want to build things or want to do whatever it is even for accounting let's say you want to like restructure like an entire company like there needs to be that creative element and it's funny like people people will say like oh like you're naturally creative or you're not i definitely wasn't naturally creative because i used to always like find it very difficult to find like new ideas or whatever but then i started just doing loads of shit and then I just kind of just found out problems from it as a result. And I'll give a good exa- example. Younger, I was always like, how do I start a business? How do I start a business? I was like looking at random stuff and I was like, could I do this? Could I do that? They're all basic shit. But then when I started my podcast, I was like, this industry is a joke. Like there's, it's all over the place and there's, there's fucking no processes and there's not even, there's not even like a site to do this or whatever. And then I was like, could I not just do all of this and just better than someone else? So slightly better, like like not like the best, but just better than someone else. And I was like, yeah, probably could do that. And I was like, okay. And I did that for a while. Then I was like, well, this is boring. I want to do something else. And I was like, well, if I added this on top of it, how does that look? I was like, oh, this is a lot better. And then you do another thing on top of it, and you're like, oh, wait, this is like a this is like a whole thing, you know? This is like a this is like a proper business. And I think that's the discovery element you get from doing your own thing. I love that. I I resonate with that quite a lot, Darren. People denote creativity to having original ideas or original outputs, but in fact, very little things are original. Creativity, I believe, is taking the truth and bending it and reflavoring it and improving it. And that's exactly what you, you brought to life there. You took a process that had historically been alive for many years, but it wasn't quite where you envisioned it to be. So you took something that was pre-made in the truth and you either improved it or reflavored it, repurposed it or uh, bended it to some degree. Um, and yeah, that, that's my reflection on that. I think there's very few original ideas. Creativity is taking an original idea and improving it and, and bending it, bending the truth. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's nothing wrong with that as well. You know, like, uh, like I'll give you like a good example. Like, so every startup is pretty much born out of inefficiency. So like, if you look at like QuickBooks or whatever those, like I actually was looking at QuickBooks earlier, like QuickBooks came from like spreadsheets being a lot of bullshit and big companies, you know, or if you ever look at like FinTech companies, the majority of them are founders who were in investment banking or operations or back office risk in um, big investment banks because they looked at some bullshit process that was happening and they were like, let's just create a tool that just automates all of this and let's just charge Goldman Sachs 50k a month for it. And they're like, let's just do that. That's that's like literally how all this <laughs> stuff is made. Now, was there a process originally? Yes, probably some sort of spreadsheet. Was there possibly a better solution? Possibly. But this is the solution that we've come up with. It's a it's a byproduct of the original process. Um, you know, that's the basis of all minor changes. And I hate using the word innovation because like technically like you're always evolving. So it's just essentially like an ongoing like iteration is how I would describe it. And that's that's kind of one reason why I love Revolut as well is because like whether I'm speaking in like a product review or whether whatever I'm doing, we're always thinking in terms of, you know, it's going to get better. So like, it's not like, oh, this design is shit or it's loads of bugs or whatever. It's like, okay, this is version one. It's what version two looks like. It's what version three looks like. It's how we're going to get it better. And like, that's the approach I take most, mostly to my life. And even with stuff that I've done, my podcasts and my business and whatnot, is that I remember like launching my podcast and similar to yourself, like, and it's like, I remember being like, I'm extroverted. I can speak well, but I can't record a podcast well. And I was like, that's weird. Why is that? Well, 
for 24 years, I've never spoke with a microphone in front of my face. That could be the first one. Second one is for 24 years, I've never spoke to someone and it's been recorded live on the internet. That could be a second one. So if I just do two of those a lot, well, then maybe I can convey who I am in a real, in a real life sense, which is on the internet. And I was like, oh, okay. I do it 10 times, get there. I do it 50 times, I realize that my questions are kind of shit. I'm losing engagement from users. I need to find different ways from it. Well, maybe if I speak about this and if I move things around, I can hold that engagement. You get to episode 100 and you're like, whoa, I can actually do all these connections. So it's that iterative model and applying it to all aspects of life, career, fitness, business, everything. I couldn't agree more. And I guess society lies to us because what people see from that process, people only see where you started and where you are now and they think it's one jump. But in fact, it's just many steps towards that. Because I remember I was asked on a solo podcast, oh, David, your guests are really great now. Um, like, it seems to be like a runaway success. And I'm like, they said, what was the one factor that denoted that? And I said, there's not one factor. It's just like exposure therapy over and over and over again. Um, mm. And you'll, 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 you'll be so aware of this. For like, every one yes of an amazing guest, you get like 10 no's. Man, way, way more, way more than that. Like, uh, like the statistics are just crazy when you look at that shit. But it's what you're describing is very good for for founders. So, um, I think like the average, oh fuck, I'm gonna f- paraphrase this, but in terms of like um, exited company, exited startup, so a startup that has been built and sold to someone, I think the average age was like 38 or like 42 or something like that. But that means that a lot of those guys have failed at startup one at 25, failed at startup two at 30, moved back to their mom's house at 32, built a new startup, and now at 38 or 40, they built another one and they've sold it. So it's like every time you're learning from it. And like I just face this on a daily basis because I look at myself continuously and I'm like, I'm an idiot. I need to continuously learn where, where are the, where's the, the blockers, let's say. Where, what am I falling down on? And I always look at that from like a career aspect, from a business aspect. It's like where... Where's the blockers? Where, where, where are we falling into issues? And those traps are meant to be there. And then there's nothing wrong with that trap, but it's about being able to fix it. But what I hate, hate is when people speak as if you're meant to know that stuff already. And that's one thing that it really pisses me off is that, you know, never like for anyone listening, like don't look at me and think like I'm successful because it's, it means not the end of the day. But what you should look at is like return and actual output. So we have a podcast, which is good, whatever. I have a career, which is, which is decent. But the worst is when someone's speaking saying, well, you know, you got to build a startup and it has to have like 50 million users and has to have the performance wise, but it also has a revenue model. And they look at companies they're like, well, that company's not making profit. It's like, what the fuck have you done? Fuck all, you've done nothing. You're sitting at home, whatever. It's like, well, <laughs> I wouldn't do this type of business because I wouldn't make that much money. Well, it's like, in fact, the best idea you could come up with would probably be something over here. Whereas for each of those people, they're learning continuously, and they, they, it's like a game of like, um, it's like it's like a video game. It's you, you unlock something, and you go into the next realm, and then you unlock that door, and you go into the next the next one, and it's always a sequence of these miniature hurdles. And every time you knock down a hurdle, you come to another one. It could be smaller, it could be bigger, but it's, an, it's getting through that hurdle. And there's always that kind of nuance, and like you'll find out in your career. You know, maybe you might get to like associate partner and think, oh, Jesus Christ, it's 10 more years to a partner. If we move to EY, get their partner tomorrow. So, and that's Monday, mo- Monday morning quarterbacking on your own career. But you shouldn't let someone have Monday morning quarterbacking on your career or someone else's at, at the same time. For the video watchers, I'm going to do the mic drop. <laughs> uh, Dan, I love this. One thing I really want to talk to you on is um, remote work. I just want you to share your experience of remote work uh, and man. what work, work looks like in these places and where, where you've been. True, man. So my, my, my main base is Singapore. So, of course, I've been here for quite some time. And, you know, I love living in Asia. I spent like a lot of years in Asia just traveling, meeting people. I think I kind of been here at a young age. Like I was first came to Asia when I was like 19. And I think I just kind of always had a bug from it. Like I, like I remember walking into Bangkok airport with my best mate, Tom. And I remember walking out and just feeling the humidity hearing the sound and just like the smell of asia and like bangkok is asia like it's just like it has that like raw asia feel and just being like i love this so that has been like a big component in like what i kind of do in my life is like having that aspect of 
freedom and flexibility. And as you spoke about at the beginning, you know, I work nights, I work European hours. So people say, oh, that's terrible, whatever. But I love it because I get all of my day to go to the beach, go for a run with my dog, take things easy, go to the gym, have a bit of fun, whatever. And what's interesting is I don't necessarily think that being remote means you're less productive. I think it's based on an individual. I know people that work in an office. I remember working in an office. He would spend half the time in the hallway on their phone or worse at the urinal and on their phone. So be based on your environment does not mean where your output is. Of course, you can take the piss and you need a level of discipline and ownership, but you are an adult. You're not a child. So you should have a level of discipline with yourself anyway, because you're not a kid. So I think that's hyper important. And I think remote work is fantastic if you have a KPI target structure, which is very helpful for me. So I have targets for everything that I do monthly, quarterly, let's say. And that means I don't take the foot off the gas. I feel like that, to your point about who should be an entrepreneur and who should be um, who, who should stay in 9 to 5, same effect. Some people should be in an office, some people shouldn't. And you know yourself. Like I've met a lot of people from, from like traveling who were like, you know, try to be work online. Was at the beach for half the half the day. It's like that's your own fault. You know, that's completely your own fault. That people maybe maybe an office. For me, I don't think I'll ever be in an office again. I don't need to be. Okay, that's just the reason why I just don't need to be. Um, maybe like if I was to move or like do something, whatever, and if I needed to meet people, whatever. But I don't think I need to be in an office. So I think that's that's the benefit it has. Um. I do see this kind of thing happening whereby people are saying that like companies are allowing them to be like forever remote, which is true, whatever. Some are saying they're not. The people who are not allowed to be fully remote will move company. They'll move to another remote company. What I do see happening is that the amount of remote only companies is decreasing. And therefore, they're putting in this like hybrid thing. Now, unless it says that you can spend four days at home in your contract, they have you by the balls. This is the way it is, right? So I think that proportion will be squeezed out. And if we look at a long enough time horizon, they'll get enough people back into an office to have a majority vote, and they'll start moving people back. It will come to the people like yourself or, or me, whatever, that are like, I just don't need to be. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't need. I don't need to be. So they'll have that collection of companies, and Revolut's actually a fully remote company. You don't actually need to be in office, which is fantastic, and they will allow um, that that flexibility, which which is amazing. So again, like everything, it's all based on an individual. Like if you can have a high level of discipline, then all good. It's good to meet people. Like I think I have like a, a dinner with some people in the next couple of weeks, which will be great. But then I will go back to my cave and I will start working really hard and I will stay in that room until the work is done. And also, like small things like this, man. Like, I don't know about you, but like as like a part-time bodybuilder, how I describe myself, like I have six meals a day, and like I have like four thousand calories a day. I need to be cooking or I've cooked food or I've prepped food all the day, like continuously. If I was to bring that into a fucking office every day, it would take me one and a half hours to prepare. It would take me. It would take. I would need my own fridge in, in there, and it would just be a, a hellhole. It'd be, it'd be it'd be a horrific idea. And there's also the nuances of like travel and that cost and the food that's involved and all that kind of bullshit. So that's my take on it. For me, I really do believe that we don't need it. Like people, some people need it, but I don't think I need it. That's the way I'd put it. I, I think that's such a really good closing that question because it goes back to what we we, we first started talking about is prioritization. Obviously, bodybuilding, um, bodybuilding is such a huge aspect of your life. Having those six meals feeds into your identity and the person that you are. So you are well suited to remote work, but there's going to be some people who, for example, flourish in physical tribes who need to be around people face to face, and that's what they prioritize and value. So I guess it goes back to the self identity piece of who you are, what you do, what you prioritize, what your values are, and design. And everyone's different. That everyone's different with it as well you know like some people will thrive in one environment some people won't and like i think for myself like i like there's just something nice about like just sitting in my room and just putting my head down and doing work you know and that's why i love being in singapore because i'm plus eight hours so if i have like a big thing i need to do and i've had like a lot of 
big things in Revolut recently that I've had to like solve myself. And it is there's a lot to be said for because like sitting down and just trying to focus on something. No distractions, whatnot. Um, even things like this, man, like as in like clothes, right? The idea of picking your clothes every day or putting on a uniform or ironing shirts is it's so archaic at this stage. Like it's such a waste of time to think about I need five of these shirts, I need three pants, I need two jackets. Like that's just crazy to me. So that whole concept of getting dressed and bringing my gym bag and bringing all my suits into the gym. So I did that in, in a century. Like I remember bringing my suits into the gym in Flyfit in Dublin at six o'clock in the morning. And I remember going into that gym every fucking morning at six o'clock in the morning, freezing cold in Dublin, bear in mind. And then I remember just thinking like, like the, the training benefits my career, but all this admin stuff of, two gear bags one for food one for my clothes the freezing cold and the fucking three dollar um lewis line with a heroin addict at the, at the bottom of it that is just not benefiting me in any way so i can just cut that out and like you know the latest thing with like entrepreneurs online is like automate delegate exterminate whatever it is just get it get out of the way <laughs> like if you're ever to think of that model surely going to an office comes into like remove that has to, you have to remove it you have to can't be part of it unless uh, unless it's within walking distance to your house yeah, I think, or you're making sales or whatever you know i think what i'd like to see in the future and i don't know if you will agree on this but like basically like co-working spaces kind of like we work but accommodation is built in so you've got like like the productivity space you live there and it's other people who are professionals, but perhaps not working in the same organization. Um, and there's obviously going to be considerations around secure, like, like privacy and security and confidentiality, of course. But I think if you had like a, a flat of different young professionals and a co-working space, meeting rooms, podcast studios, and that kind of stuff, I think that would be like the perfect model for me. Um, That's sick. I, th I thought I heard someone building that variation, kind of like a WeWork company. But there's a few other variations of it. Like, so... In when I was in Dublin, I had that. Um, I actually had an office in my apartment complex, and we have something similar here. Like in Singapore, the condos are like super, super bougie. It's like they compete on like amenities, so they have like office space stuff like that. But yeah, like we work is great. Like we have a we work office in, in Singapore, but again, like what do I get from being in that office? That's that's what I think about. Is like, and like this is why, like this is kind of like controversial, but like you know that kind of like founder friend approach, like no problem with people being like friends with each other, obviously, but like are people hanging out with each other because they're procrastinating on ideas in an office or are they genuinely helping each other? And I always think about this stuff. So it's like, of course, like a career is also lonely. People say like entrepreneurship is lonely, but careers are also lonely because if you are, you know, like, like you're not, how are you going to turn around to your fucking mate who's an analyst and say, I hate this place, whatever, whatever, you know, it's, it's a, it's a difficult, like, thing to manage so you are around people but it's also a lonely a lonely thing so i feel like that people cling on to the office or founder friends because they're trying to look for just like i don't know looking for support you know what i mean but that's why you know you have like a girlfriend or that's why you have like other people that you, you hang out with and i often find that as well with, with founders like people have co-founders so co-founders for, for a technical company makes a lot of sense you have one technical guy one business guy like me like i couldn't develop let's say but i could chat shit and do sales that makes sense but in an agency set setting whereby you would do a service for someone terrible idea social media marketing horrific idea Im iman gadzi spoke about this and i'm actually going to like cite him in this he was saying that people just do it because they're lonely that's just the, one, the only reason so they go in they go in have a they split 50 50 dilute the shit out of their profits because they're lonely whereas they could have hired someone who could have worked with them and said oh how do we fix this? How do we do this? And man said, oh, that's it. And, oh, okay. Problem solved. Not lonely anymore. <laughs> and I, I am a victim to that. The many times I've thought of an idea or business idea and said to a mate, like, do you want to be my co-founder? Only because I don't, I want to share the risk as well. I want to share the risk. Um, and I want, if, if there is a high level of risk, I want that comfort. I want someone to lean on. I want to just to kind of outsource some of the risk. Um, so mm -hmm. if I'm going to suffer, someone's going to suffer with me. And I, I think you're so right about the re reflections of the office. If you 
live an unfulfilled career, the reason that you value the office so much is because you have a, a peer to, to kind of run through it with. You have someone else who's suffering, you know? Um, and that's why, like, being fully remote is interesting because you have, like, one-to-ones with people. Like, I have one-to-ones with all my engineers and I have one-to-ones with all my managers and stuff. Check in. He's like, how are you doing? Doing good. What's pissing you off? This, whatever. Move on. Like, that's, like, the, that's like the reality. That's like the touch point. If there's a bigger issue, it's work-related. Like, it's, like, a work problem that we're solving, you know? Uh, it's, like, a product problem that we're solving. So I do think that we can bypass all of that stuff. And, again, streamline your life. Get down into the, into the core basis. Because, like, and, like, team bonding, all that stuff, it's all good. It's very valuable. and something that I do think is, like, is, hu- is hugely valuable. Do I think we need to be together 40 hours a week for that? No. And the reason why is because your best mates or your old mates, you can meet them once every two weeks, go for a coffee, catch up. It's the same, whatever. If anything, it's actually better than being around them the entire time. My girlfriend next door will tell you that she gets pissed off at me way too often because we live together, we work together, and we're always together. So there's obviously that aspect of when you're around someone 24-7, you're going to make it even worse. So being in an office 24-7 can actually have a negative output because you're going to actually end up worse off because you're around someone 24-7. <laughs> oh, Darren, this has been great fun. You've wrapped all the lessons up from today and packaged that into Podcast University, or which is your podcast accelerator. I'm a member of it, which details some of these insights, but mostly the insights of over 100 episodes. Why did you, give, why did you, why did you decide to give it away and what should people expect from it? Good question. So basically, I suppose I've been at the game for a while. So the whole idea was that I think like in this kind of new digital era is that people just want to learn either to themselves or whatnot. So beyond like coaching and consulting, I felt like that a lot of people just want to, let's say, start a podcast or well, our roadmap is much is much broader. We're going to build out much more uh, courses and, and products next year. But people want these services on the go and they want to be able to consume them themselves. And I feel like learning content is really important. So my goal, I suppose, one of my goals next year is just to build out a shitload of learning, learning content for people to do free webinars, do a lot of free, um, free webinars, do a lot of workshops, do a lot of checklists, all this kind of good stuff in the space of, of, of podcasting. So like, no matter what your niches are, our audiences, we run into the same problems. Like I do a lot of calls a week, let's say, and everybody has the same shit. Can't launch, can't grow can't get guests, can't do this, can't send outbound messages, can't grow my channel. So it's all the same shit. So when you find commonalities, you often put them together and put them into like a product that's affordable for people. Um, and that's kind of the goal. You know, that's kind of what I what I hope to achieve. Um, and again, like everything, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be like a long roadmap, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And I enjoy it. Like, it's funny when you, I often think that like the best way to learn is to teach someone. So if you want to learn something is just teach something that's like a step or two back to somebody else. And for me to be able to teach people like how to launch a podcast properly, it's been very good to introspectively look back on what I've done and say, Jesus Christ, all that was wrong. <laughs> all that was wrong. Do it this way. Do it this way instead. And you know, I was able to break down what took me months of pain and torture into, you know, a couple of hours, into into a couple, a couple of courses. And what's funny is that like the beauty of this stuff is that it's very transferable and it's timeless. You know, a lot of people that helped me get off my, get off the ground when I launched my podcast were people that honestly God created videos eight years ago, nine years ago. So things had adjusted, but I suppose I just do have like a love for production and, and product. So being able to convey that together and try to help people produce stuff is, is, is what I want to do, I guess. And where, where I want to go to. And I can back the content already. It's stuff that I, be, being half the episodes behind you, I'm, I'm implementing to improve my Appreciate game. It, man. If anyone wants to check it out, get involved, where can they find you? Kickoff sessions and uh, the podcast university. Where, where can people find you? Of course. So again, LinkedIn, main platform, uh, publish every single day. New podcast out even out today. Um, apart from that, kickoff sessions is on Spotify. Um, it is on Apple. You can find myself, Darren Lee, on YouTube. Um, I have my own personal channel there where my podcasts are and then Podcast University is just podcastuniversity.com so we have our initial course which is Podcast Accelerator and then we're going to have more courses next year which is going to be really good so it's going to be like a learning platform for like everyone I'm going to make it super affordable and hopefully the whole idea is like 
make this process of what we're doing here today a lot easier for other people. Darren, I love this chat. Thank you for stopping by on the Development by David podcast. Until next time. Thanks, bro.